Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Bonsoir to le monde et bienvenue. I am Harvey Slack, a trustee of the Ottawa Public Library Board, and I'm delighted to be here this evening. Before we begin, it is important to acknowledge, even as we gather virtually, we are on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Nous rendons hommage à toutes les Premières Nations, les Inuit et les Métis, leurs années, leurs ancêtres et leurs précieux contributions passées et présentes. I would like to thank our partners in organizing this event, the Ottawa International Writers' Festival and Library and Archives Canada. The Ottawa Public Library is very proud to host this virtual book launch of acclaimed local author, Francis Itani's latest novel, The Company We Keep. Like many of you, I cannot wait to dive into her new book and hear what she can tell us about it tonight. You may wish to mark your calendars for our next two authors events. Next Monday, August the 24th, we will receive Emma Donahue, the best-selling author of The Wonder and Room to talk about her latest, the Pool of the Stars. And on Monday, August 31st, join us for a chat with Lev Grossman, the number one New York Times best-selling author of The Magicians, who will tell us all about his new book, The Silver Arrow. Please do visit the Ottawa Public Library website to find out all about our upcoming programs and to access varied and excellent library resources online. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Sean Wilson from the Ottawa International Writers' Festival to say a few words. Thank you and have a good evening. Merci et bonne soirée. Thank you so much, Harvey. Uh, on behalf of the Writers' Festival, I wanna thank everyone for being here and especially wanna thank our partners at the Ottawa Public Library and Library and Archives Canada um, for allowing us to pivot uh, to an online model. I know we all wish we were gathering in person, uh, especially now that I hear Francis has champagne set aside, uh, you know, and unfortunately she's not in my bubble, so uh, I'm going to have to enjoy that remotely. Um, but this is for us the launch of, of our most ambitious uh, pivot ever in the history. In the 23 years we've been running the Writers' Festival, uh, we've never changed things up as much as we have this year. And uh, um, after tonight, every single week, you're going to see live events, uh, pre-recorded interviews, and the new podcast. Details uh, for all of that are available at writersfestival.org. Um, but really, this evening, it's all about Francis and the company we keep. And I just want to say, the spirit of collaboration is the one thing that I think is going to bring us all through this crisis. And I think there's something really beautiful about the fact that our host this evening is Hélène Giroux, who's the director of the Wakefield La Peche Writer Festival des Écrivains, um, another wonderful um, part of our local literary community. And so I'm hoping she's going to give us a little sense of how they are moving online, uh, as well as we kick off this, this wonderful launch for, for Francis Atani. Again, thank you all for being here and uh, uh, do check out our entire season and let's give a warm virtual welcome to our host this evening, Hélène Giroux. Thank you, Sean. Um, uh, I do want to say a little bit about uh, our seventh uh, edition. Uh, we'll be also pivoting uh, online and um, we're in the process of uh, setting up a uh, safe and secure uh, studio space in the uh, iconic uh, Black Sheep Inn uh, in Wakefield. And we'll start uh, live streaming a series of uh, four or five uh, events in, um, on Wednesday, November 18th in the fall. So uh, we're pretty excited about that. And we'll be uh, putting up some uh, programming details on our own website at uh, writersfet.com. So please uh, do, check, uh, do check that out uh, in, the next, uh, in the next while. And we look forward to welcoming you. Um, before I introduce uh, Francis Atani, just a few words this evening about, uh, about the format. We'll enjoy a 40 minute conversation with Francis 
followed by uh, about 20 minutes of, uh, of questions from, uh, from audience, from our audience. Welcome uh, to you all. And um, I would ask you to wait until uh, the end of our conversations to, uh, to, pose, uh, to pose your questions, and I will invite you to do so again. And um, I also invite you to use the um, Zoom Q&A uh, feature and uh, the uh, Facebook chat feature to ask uh, your questions. So thank you very much uh, for that. Um, it's now my honor, my privilege, my delight to uh, introduce uh, Frances Itani. She's a distinguished Canadian uh, author, award-winning author. Uh, Ms. Itani has written 18 books. Uh, her novels include uh, one of her latest, which um, is uh, That's My Baby, Tell, which uh, was shortlisted for the Scotiabank uh, Giller Prize, Requiem, which was chosen by the Washington Post as one of the top fiction titles of, uh, of 2012, Remembering the Bones, published internationally and shortlisted for Commonwealth's Writer's Prize, uh, and the number one uh, best, bestseller, Deafening, which won a Commonwealth Writer's Prize and was selected for CBC's Canada Reads. Frances is a three-time winner of, CBC, of the CBC Lit Literary Prize, and she is a member of the Order of Canada and the recipient of the first 2019 Library and Archives Canada Scholars Award. Um, and uh, uh, a bit of uh, uh, great news this evening. Um, her website has just gone up, so uh, I do invite you to uh, check out Francis Itani's new website at uh, francisitani.com. Francis, it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening. It's a delight to be with you and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. It's so nice to be here and good to work with you, Elan, again. This is lovely. And I too want to thank everyone for tuning in. I mean, I do get the opportunity because we're virtual here to invite people from right across the country and, and in the United States and in Europe. So this is quite lovely. And I, I want to thank all of the people who um, were able to respond to the invitation and tune in as well as the organizers and my hosts. So thank you all. Francis, I'd like to remind you of something that happened exactly a year ago today. On August 18th last year, 2019, you and I were having brunch at um, one of your favorite cafes in Ottawa. Uh, the cafe was buzzing. Uh, people were milling on the sidewalk. They were walking their dogs. They were talking. Uh, it was just a typical busy Sunday morning. And that's when you shared with me that uh, you were writing a new book, a book about loss and grief. Um, there's a hint of irony this evening as we launch your book virtually, The Company We Keep. I'll just uh, show it uh, to, our, uh, to our guests. It's a beautiful book, it feels good to hold, and it's a lovely, uh, it's a lovely cover. Um, your book is about six strangers who um, connect uh, together to share their stories of, of loss and um, to share how uh, they, uh, that they, they have grieved um, together. Um, the isolation that haunts your characters seems to be a strange precursor of the times that we are living in right now, but you go beyond um, your book also offers, it offers solace, it offers beauty, and um, it does um, offer how each, how each of your individuals ultimately uh, heals. Um, and I'd like to begin before the beginning. Um, I felt that your book began even before the first chapter. Uh, in your dedication, Francis, you, uh, you speak to important lifelong friendships. You speak of the 63s, of whom you say, I've got your back. I know you've got mine. Tell us about these important people in your life and what you mean to each other. Well, this is an important dedication for me. Um, the 63s are my, um, the members of my nursing class back in 1963, which means 
we all entered nursing in 1960s, so we've known one another for, what would that be? That would be what, 57, 60 years for heaven's sake, 60 years. I mean, there we were over a hundred when we graduated and um, here we are 60 years later, all roughly the same age because we all went into nursing, you know, plus or minus year 18. And, um, and here we are now still around 100 or over 100. I mean, who can say that, you know, my 100 friends out there from my nursing school, yeah, I mean, we've, we've been meeting just about every five years as much as possible for their alumni meetings. And then there's another smaller group within that group, which was my affiliating group. And as you'll notice in the dedication, those people are named. That was our little group nine. And we tried to meet um, almost every year, actually, for in the last 20, 20 years or so. So these people are very important to me. I know that I could ask for help from any one of them, and uh, any one of them would offer to help. We do stay in touch. We have uh, we don't have a website anymore, but we do have class emails. So I was so happy to be able to uh, to dedicate this book to those nursing pals of mine. Uh, do you think some of them are listening this evening? Oh, for sure. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I would be surprised if not. <laughs> and during these times, just quickly, how do you keep connected? Well, we do have this group, a group email, which is very large. So we're able to, uh, yeah, we're able to send messages back and forth. We also have one particular member of the class. Her name is Marg McDonald, who is, takes on a kind of executive role for us all and keeps us all connected and together. So uh, yeah, she does kind of a special thing for this group. That's great. You're very lucky to have these special uh, friendships in your lives and, and, and you nurture them well, I think. Absolutely. Um, in the company we keep, uh, Francis, you allow us to bear witness to the lives of six strangers, to examine how they love, how they feel loneliness, how they experience loss. Each of them are feeling, what I found in each of your characters is that they each feel grief in, um, in a very unique way and in, in one of the many of its complex uh, guises. Um, each is also seeking very meaningful connectedness, a little bit in the way that you've just spoken of the important friendships uh, in your life. And I'd like to offer you to, I'd like to invite you to offer um, a brief reading so that we might get to know a bit about your, uh, about your characters. So um, could okay. you uh, choose something that you'd like to share with us? I'm going to read just a, a fair, just a, a short passage. It's only a page or just under a page. Um, and so I thought I would write, I actually have, I have six main characters, yes, but I also have a parrot named Rico and you'll see the parrot on the cover. Rico is an African gray. So I really have to say I have seven characters. Um, but this, uh, this short passage I'm going to read is uh, about Gwen. Gwen is recently widowed. She's in her early 60s and she has retired as an accountant. She has taken on a parrot sitting job for a complete stranger. She saw a notice in a store and she phoned and she took on the job. And so it's, it, the job is to last for several months and her job is to not only care for the parrot and feed and clean and so on, but she has to provide conversation. This is a very important very important task and role for a parrot sitter or for anyone who owns a parrot. And if you don't talk to the parrot, the parrot will start pulling out its feathers. The parrot will die. So she has to visit this home of these strangers twice a day and she's been left a key and she goes in. So not only does she talk to Rico, the parrot, but she also has decided to read to, to Rico. So I'm going to read this short passage about her reading about King Arthur. She glanced over at the parrot. Okay, here goes, from Laoman's Brute. This is about escape, Rico, make no mistake. You might not understand, but it helps. She heard both sadness and apology in her voice. She stood the way she imagined an orator would stand before a crowd. Up caught Arthur his shield before his breast, 
and he gan to rush as the howling wolf when he cometh from the wood, be hung with snow, and thinketh to bite such beasts as he liketh. Rico turned to one side and bobbed his head. She saw the white circles, the black pinpoint pupils. Maybe your owners don't read aloud. Maybe they don't read at all. Do I see any books around here? You've probably never listened to an Arthurian tale, any tale for that matter. Rico dropped to a lower perch and stilled as if waiting. No display of agitation. She turned a page. He cocked his head upward and investigated the ceiling as if he wasn't a part of this at all. Not my scene. Did he want something? Cecilia Grand had underlined social interaction is vital. Rico didn't seem to be in a hurry for seeds or pellets or treats. The water container was full. Could he be enjoying the sound of a reading voice? Gwen decided to continue. Woe came upon the people, she said, and set the pages down. She was thinking of the group at Cassie's. Woe was what everything was about these days. Perhaps each person in the group was acquainted with a different version. Her woe was her life with Brig. She had lied about him to the others. They probably thought she was someone who had buried herself for years in a dingy office and maybe she had, but she liked the group, the people who were part of it. She just wasn't entirely comfortable there. Absolutely no one had mentioned the way grief could pursue, a scythe whipping through the air, closing in on the wounded. Was she the only one? She would not be able to explain this to the others, her wounds, and maybe what was in pursuit was not grief at all. She plunked down in the chair and began to cry. Woe indeed. Thank you, Francis. Um, you've introduced us to Gwen and to your seventh character, Rico. There are others, there are five others in the book. Um, sometimes authors, writers, um, put something of themselves in their characters. And I'd like to ask you whether you've written yourself in any of your characters. Well, that's a pretty interesting question because when I started this book, it's very unusual for me to write a book with six main characters. I mean, each one is equal to the next. So this is pretty unusual. And it also means that as a novelist, I have to tell six individual stories as well as one overall story. So that, that was my big challenge. So it was really interesting because when Joan Thomas, a friend in Winnipeg, who's a very fine writer, uh, she was here in town actually last, uh, it was, you know, last fall, she won the Governor General's Award for Five Wives. And she and I were out having brunch one morning. I, I always love going out with my friends for brunch. <laughs> and we were having brunch. Um, and in Ottawa here while she was here. And I told her I was writing a story about six characters and I just told her a little bit about it because I was working on the novel pretty solidly by then. And she said, oh, Francis. I mean, there was almost a mischievous kind of, you know, comment. She said, oh, Francis, that means you can put a little bit of yourself into each one of the characters. And I thought, wow, that's pretty intuitive and perceptive, but it's the kind of comment another writer would make to a writer. And I thought about it later, after she'd gone back to Winnipeg, I thought about it later, and um, I, I spoke, I didn't, I didn't think of it as an opportunity to put a little bit of me, but when I, when I actually examined the characters after talking to Joan, I thought, okay, yeah, um, there's Chio who loves film, I love film. That gives me the opportunity to have Chio, hmm, you know, I mean, but I'd, al I'd already written Chio before I was thinking of this, um, but Chio pretty well relates almost every scene to a character she knows from films. And there's Hasley who does the crossword every day, but she also works as an editor. And Hasley's great love is the love of words. And so that part of myself, you know, goes into Hasley. Well, there's probably, I mean, 
you know, Hilary Mantel has talked about, and many other writers have talked about, um, how we are, our characters, our characters are us. Of course, the writer is always the characters. And uh, I mean, there's no separating them out, but, um, but it's an interesting way to look at things. It's also an interesting way to get to know you a little bit more. Um, <laughs> I think I'm going to reread the book and uh, I'm going to see, I, I, I know you a bit, so I'm going to see where I can find you in some of these uh -huh. characters <laughs> and, uh, and in your other books as well. Um, it's, it's a very intriguing way of learning, to, uh, of learning about an author. Um, but, I did not, but I did not plan that, so you might have a hard time doing that actually. <laughs> You didn't plan it. It was just organic. It just came through very, very intuitively. Okay. Um, Francis, um, for your books, you're, you're, you're known uh, for your, your very intense and your very detailed uh, research. Um, I know about the research uh, that you did. You immersed yourself in the, in the, in the, in the history of of uh, the First World War and in sign language for deafening and, and for tell. Um, for the, uh, for That's My Baby, which that's my baby for the third book uh, in, the, in the trilogy. You, um, uh, you researched uh, the era of the big bands and of jazz. Um, these are just two examples of, of how you just uh, do a deep dive uh, into, um, into the work, uh, into the writing that you're doing. Um, but as I was reading The Company We Keep, I was wondering how you researched loss and grief and the healing that, uh, that you portray. Um, you've portrayed, you portrayed the, the, um, uh, the, the experiences of your characters with, uh, with compassion, uh, with realism, uh, with humor, um, yet without sentimentality. Um, I feel in part that your book is almost a call to action, um, to attend to one another, uh, to ask, are you okay? Um, to reach beyond that island of grief um, that sorrow can be. And uh, what I'm wondering is how did you approach uh, your, your, your research or, or the, 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 the portrayal of, of grief and sorrow and of healing in, um, in, in the company we keep? And um, I'll ask you the question later again, but would you agree that your book is in part a call to action? Well, if it is a call to action, that would not be intended because, you know, I, do, I, don't, I don't kind of plant things like that into my work. Um, I just present. My job is to present. And that's what I try to do. Um, but to research grief, um, I was researching many things in this book, actually, but I, I go to my friends. So I go to my friends, um, my very good friends, and I say, talk to me about loss. Talk to me about grief. And we chat away, and people are used to me. My good friends are used to me asking very direct <laughs> questions like this. And um, so we have long conversations about things like that. I definitely did not want this to be a clinical approach to grief. I did not want to have anything to do with going through the stages of grief. I wanted this to be a realistic look at people who were not sitting around contemplating their own mortality after someone they, loves, they love has died. They are trying to figure out how to get through to the next day and what they'll do with the next day. And so I wanted to look at realism. And of course, with, with six characters plus Rico the parrot, each of them comes from a different background. And then I began to research the various backgrounds. I mean, one is an antique dealer, um, one is a Syrian refugee. And uh, I interviewed my, my new, now, you know, not so new friend in Kingston, Jamal Saeed, uh, who helped me with detail uh, when I needed it. Um, I was researching ventriloquism, you know, just like small things. There, there were lots of small things. Um, just, just about all of the details in any book of mine are going to be researched. So I wasn't only talking about grief. 
I was looking to see what kind of backgrounds they had, how they would deal with each other. And then of course, as the characters start to grow um, and interact more importantly, um, they, I'm, and by grow, I don't mean their personal growth. I mean, grow in my novel as they begin to develop in my novel. I get to know them better. And, uh, and then I get to know, you know what to expect from them and how they would behave. So I, th I think ultimately I, I was trying to say, look, this is a universal human condition. Grief, loss, the smallest child who has lost a pet knows about grief. Um, we've all lost something. Um, we've all grieved. So it's, it's a universal human condition. But I really wanted to say, we are stumbling and maneuvering our way through whatever, loss, grief, however, with imprecision. We are imprecise about how we live our lives. And that's what makes us human, really. This is our, you know, our human commonality. Because each of my six characters is grieving in a different way, is grieving something different um, from each of the others. And, and yet there are commonalities, of course, and this is what they begin to find. Have, have I answered your question? <laughs> <laughs> I don't um, know. Yes, I, I was thinking about uh, just to, um, to uh, just to, uh, to get back to one of your other comments, one of the things I thought was particularly beautiful about your book, and you just spoke about it right now, is um, uh, how each of them is experiencing their loss and, and uh, in, in a different way, and how you bring us uh, to six different stories. And when you were talking about, for example, researching um, uh, antiques, or so there's a, there's a story about that. There's a story about Chio and um, her Japanese heritage and the story of Japanese internment camps in Canada. So there's, 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 you, you take us, you take us in all of these uh, branches, then you bring us back. Um, and uh, I thought that was, um, that was particularly uh, beautiful in how you did it. And, and my comment about a call to action, I think is because I was reading your book during the times that we're living as we're walking around a little bit faceless with masks and we're walking very quickly and um, sometimes not spending the time to reach out to those who might look a little bit uh, a little bit uncomfortable um, a little bit sad uh, and so I think it's the prism through which I was reading your book that made me think well maybe stop to pause to engage with those I, I go through with in life so that was uh, that was my that was my perception of the call to action. Yes, and well, I have just written a, actually a COVID story, a short story, it's called Bubble Strategies. Um, I finished it about a week, or so, a week or so ago, and I very much address in that story how I feel, how we feel, how my character, it's a fictional story, um, how we feel when we're out there and we are masked and we can't tell the expression behind the mask and how uh, people recoil from one another or step off the sidewalk or you know, wait with their arms folded across their chest until someone goes by or become evasive or turn away. And uh, this is having, it's going to have consequences, I think. So it is really important, just as my characters do in the book, they all start getting along and liking one another. And, you know, I mean, one might like someone else a little bit more than the other, but, but they begin to come together as a group and, and they do start reaching out. And I think that is what we are trying to do today is like reach out for sure, check on one another, um, be there, be aware. We're, I think we're becoming very much aware. Yeah. Thank you. Um, poetry, etymology, other art forms are featured in the company we keep. And I'd like to ask you how, how literary and other art forms influence your writing. And um, 
uh, and particularly in, in, in this current book? Well, I mean, again, having six characters, this gives me a huge opportunity to kind of be all over the place and yet stick with the main characters. So, um, so I have six chances, as it were, to, um, to assign certain traits. So Addie loves to listen to um, classical music. So I get my opportunity to put classical music. Um, Tom, when he's driving home from the airport at the beginning, listens to uh, Joe Cocker with a little help from my friends. Um, there's lots of poetry in the book and yes. that gets a chance to discuss both um, modern poetry, contemporary poetry and very old poetry because Tom, as it turns out, had been given a very old poetry book by his late grandfather and Tom is in his late seventies. So the book had been around for a long time, but he gets to recite and he even writes poem. He's a clandestine poet. He writes his own poetry, but he hides it in a drawer in his, in his office, in his antique store and you know, his desk. And um, what else I use? Oh, an art. I mean, for my own, you know, for my own benefit. I mean, I, I love the art of Jack Shadbolt, for instance. And sometimes when I'm working on a novel, I just, I mean, I, I just, have to go and see some Jack Shadwell paintings. So I've even, you know, gone into uh, some of the galleries here in Ottawa who've pulled out some Jack Shadwells that are in storage so that I can see them. And I'm fortunate enough to have a couple of my own as well. So um, art, art is uh, hugely important to me. I call upon it in my own work. Music always, there's music in every single book I write. Um, and again, I get the chance to choose the kind of music I want. Um, I grew up, you know, singing and hmm, listening to my, watching my parents waltz to those big round records, whatever they were, were they 78s? I don't know, those great big, well, you know, teaching the children in the living room to how to waltz to these great big old records and then being, a, being, um, you know, in the 60s, I was an intensive care nurse and uh, I was not dancing to the Beatles, I assure you. I was going to work every day at the Ottawa Civic Hospital being an intensive care nurse. That is pretty tough work. Um, but there were the Beatles, you know, in my 60s, Elvis when I was 14 or 15. And then in That's My Baby, for instance, I had such, it was so pleasurable for me to to research jazz for those three or four years that it took to write that book and listen to Duke Ellington um, and his work for, for those years. And with Requiem, Beethoven, I was able to listen to Beethoven, fabulous recordings for three years. So it's, it's very important to me to turn to the arts. I find that the arts heal. Um, art saves me in many ways. Many people don't have the opportunity to you know, avail themselves of art, but uh, I certainly try to, and I try to include it in my work as much as possible. And you did um, a couple of um, of references in um, in the company we keep that um, that resonated with me were, were your references to film, to bel canto, for example. Um, yes. uh, you also spoke about Pina Bach and uh, that. So what it does to the reader, I think it, it reminds uh, us of, of, what, of what else is out there. And what I felt is it inspired me to go to those and to, yes. to renew my acquaintance to, with, with the music and with the film. And uh, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very inspiring that way. Well, that's great. I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that actually. As for Pina Bausch, I mean, I think the, you know, the late Pina Bausch, the choreographer, her Wuppertal uh, dance company is, I, in my mind, the best in the world. It's certainly one of the best in the world. I would go anywhere to see it when, it's, uh, when it shows up in our own country. And um, that deals with the absurd. It's why I love it. It deals with the beautiful, uh, contrasted with the absolutely bizarre and absurd. And it runs that fine line. And it's the very kind of fine line that I like to use in my work. Um, you spoke about Hilary Mantel a little earlier. 
And um, some time ago, you also had shared some words, some of Hillary's words with me. Um, you spoke about the writing of the story becomes part of the story. And the good thing about being a writer is that you take your bad experiences and you make them pay. I'd like to know why these words resonated with you, Francis, and did they relate to what you wrote in the company we keep? Well, Hillary Mantel, as you can, as you can tell, I'm a fan of hers. <laughs> she's, she's a brilliant writer. Um, I just finished the last of her trilogy, the uh, Thomas Cromwell uh, series. But um, yeah, the 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 writing being a journey is. Uh, well, every, every book I write is a journey. I think the writing of the, an actual book being part of the story pertains more to the, the, to the writer than to the reader because the reader isn't going to know all of the things that have gone into that. But the writer certainly is, is aware of them. And, it, and this is why someday I hope to write a memoir at some point because, because for me, every single book I write is a journey. It's a personal journey for me. I learn from it. I, um, I love taking those journeys. I know when I go into something that it has to be something I really care about because I know that I have to live with it in my head for several years. So that's pretty important. And um, it is, it just becomes a really um, big part of my life and, and often changes me, enhances my knowledge for sure, because I do you know, enormous research. Also, because I meet the people who are the experts everywhere. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I go and find out where the knowledge is and I interview people. And, and uh, like with deafening, I, you know, I learned sign language. I became part of the Ottawa deaf community. Um, there's just, um, I don't know, it's, there are huge personal journeys for me. Uh, the writing of the story for me is absolutely as important as the story itself. And, um, what was the other, the other part of that question? What was yeah, it? Was the um, the good thing about being a writer is that you take your bad experiences and you make them pay. Uh, <laughs> this is a great advantage for a writer. Actually, you can you know how we all deal badly with with some things at certain times in our life, or we wish things had gone a, a different way, or whatever. Um, uh, this is where the writer can uh, just uh, infuse a character with the solution or uh, set up the same situation, but have the character deal with it in the way maybe the writer wishes he or she had done in the first place. <laughs> so yeah, and bad experiences can be turned to, uh, to literature. They can be turned to good. Um, certainly it helps the writer and hopefully it helps the readers too. Um, I'll follow up on this question in a moment, but I'd like to take, um, we're, we're at the time where we can, uh, we're almost at the time where we can take questions from, uh, from the audience. So I'd like to invite the audience on, um, to uh, write in your questions on either um, uh, Zoom Q&A or uh, Facebook chat. And um, I think we have a few here, um, but I will have to look at them. And um, one of them uh, is, um, do you, Francis, do your friends recognize themselves or parts of themselves in your novel? Uh, well, I'm not, in any novel, I guess that would mean any novel yeah. at all. Um, oh yes, people, oh, oh, not individuals, no. I never write about any particular individual that I know. And if I, if I actually write a story that uh, I've been told or an anecdote, and integrate it into a character, I always get permission from that person. So no, in fact, the answer is no. I mean, I do have imagination. There is no <laughs> novel, you know, there, there isn't a novelist who doesn't have imagination. I mean, that's one of the things, one of the reasons we become novelists because we can imagine any, any scenario and any situation. Um, so, um, do people find themselves in my work? I hope so, because I would like to think that my work um, does touch upon the universal human condition. Um, and uh, I will tell you that over the 45 years, if one can believe it, 45 years I've been writing now, um, when people come down out of the audience after I've given a presentation on stage or after I've given a reading or whatever, 
people will bring photographs. Some people have showed up at, uh, in theaters where I've been on stage with large framed photos of relatives who were in the First World War, for instance. People have brought um, and contacted me about their parents or their relatives who were in the same school for the deaf as my late deaf grandmother. Um, people are coming to me and saying, that book is about me. When I wrote Requiem, the very first reading I gave, I think it was in the county, in Prince Edward County, um, a Japanese man stood up in the audience and he had finished rec reading Requiem uh, before he came to the reading. And he said, you have told my life story. This is so rewarding for me. This is wonderful for me. It means I got it right. I think you'll find that uh, with the company we keep and um, how each of your characters is experiencing grief, loss and healing, I think you'll find that uh, people will reach out to you in the same way. At least um, I have, I can. Um, Francis, you spoke about a short story, a new short story. And um, a few uh, guests have asked where they can get a copy of, uh, of this latest short story that you wrote during the pandemic. Um, I'll put that up on my website when I know, because first of all, it has to be bought. My agent would love to see it. She hasn't seen it yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes. so yes. So what I would do is I would invite people to uh, check in at francisitani.com and um, uh, in, in a little while. Um, I'll just go to some of the other uh, questions. Uh, there's a, a comment of appreciation, um, Francis, um, for, uh, for all of your work. Um, there's also someone who uh, said that they recognized themselves in, in one of your stories um, as well. Um, what I'd like to, um, uh, here's a, how much does your nursing experience influence your writing? I would say a very great deal because nursing um, is a, um, it's nursing as a profession deals with human behavior, human uh, behavior at a very intimate level. Um, after I stopped nursing and became a writer, I went back to school. I did, I did several degrees. I did a degree in psychology. I've always been interested in human behavior. It is what it is what I'm I'm mainly interested. It's what fires me up. It's you know, I want to understand the human condition. I want to see how people behave. That's what interests me most in life. So the nursing uh, probably set me up for that. But I would have I would have had that curiosity beforehand in any case. Um, but what it has done in terms of actual uh, contributing in an actual way to my work is I have a medical background. I know the language. I can create characters. Um, for instance, I was able to, I chose purposely because I could handle it to write in deafening um, a World War I stretcher bearer. That, that was very easy for me to do because I was able to um, to uh, research World War I of my own you know, general hospital, the uh, number one Canadian general hospital included uh, the Montreal General, which was my hospital, and McGill, a huge history. It must have been three inch, a three inch read for sure. Um, but I can handle the language and it's, uh, it's an area of comfort for me. So I, I uh, sometimes will put a character um, in, uh, in a hospital setting. I worked in many hospitals. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just comfortable there. Uh, thank you. Um, you. I think you just spoke a, a little bit to this question, but um, someone would like to know, what was your personal motivation for writing about loss and grief? It's a more intimate question. Hmm. Um, I'm, this actually started, the, the book didn't start to be about loss and grief at all. Um, the book started with the parrot. Um, <laughs> I the, parrot, the parrot on the cover of the book. That's right. It was started with with the parrot um, because I met I met uh, Margaret Williams, who's a, a reference librarian in Brockville, and she just happened to mention to me that she was uh, going off to parrot sit after the event that I had just done, and I I kind of stopped her cold in this in the middle of a very cold winter day, 
and said, wait a minute, uh, could you please tell me a bit about that? So we, we began to exchange information and, and uh, she started sending me emails and I contacted her and I said, okay, I just, I need, like when a writer hears something like that and when it triggers something, I knew right away I was gonna write about that. So, so this book was not about grief at the beginning. It was about somebody who is parrot sitting. And then I thought, okay, who is this person? And then I made her very tall and thin. And then I thought, oh, this woman is bullied. Now this is, you know, some people just start growing in my mind. The characters just start growing in my mind. And then I added in another and another and another. And then I started doing parrot research. And then of course I went to Carlton Place with my cousin, Joel, and we, and we did a three hour visit to the parrot, uh, parrot partners. Uh, of course you, you would. Pardon? <laughs> of course. <laughs> Yes. Oh, it was, yeah, it was pretty phenomenal learning all this stuff. I mean, I learned an enormous amount about parrots and filled up a notebook while I was there just scribbling away while my cousin was taking photographs. And I have to tell you that when I met a specific, after meeting the many dozens of parrots, I met a specific African gray that was brought into the room. And the African gray hopped down onto the table, came right over to me, picked up my pen in its beak and held the pen over my notebook as if it was going to write its own story. So that's what, um, I actually put that scene in the book. <laughs> um, excuse me, just a moment. Um, if you weren't a writer, is there any other career or art form you would pursue? Oh, art form. I always wanted to blow a horn. I wanted to play the trumpet or something like that. I've always loved music. I used to play piano by ear. I played everything by ear. I sang to my kids until they were probably sick of hearing me. It would have been something in music. And then I always thought that if I were to do another hmm, degree in something, it, it perhaps would be philosophy. Although that's pretty heavy on reading too. And I, you know, that's very heavy on reading. And I, mean, I don't know if I have that much time. It speaks very much to your um, to your uh, to your interest and your passion for unraveling the human condition. Mm -hmm. um, how do you arrive at the narrative structure of each of your novels? Um, and this uh, guest uh, cites remembering the bones as a fabulous concept for storytelling. And I think once upon a time you said that remembering the bones was one of your favorite books that you had written. That's true. I'm so fond of that book because I had so much fun writing it. Um, for Remembering the Bones, the structure was almost a given. Sometimes it's difficult to find structure uh, when you're a novelist or a story writer, but structure has to exist, so you have to find it somehow. So with Remembering the Bones, um, it became the journey on the way to the airport, the whole novel in the ravine with Georgie lying on her back, and then the end which nobody has ever totally understood. Does Georgie never die? I've never discussed it. I'll never, I never will. <laughs> so that structure was, was there. This, uh, the structure for the company we keep, I found that uh, actually that came quite easily too. I didn't have to struggle with it. Um, I just began to have meetings. Um, I struggled a bit with it, but that was just part of the normal struggle of being a writer. Um, separating it up into months. I made a decision pretty early on that the book would start in September and end probably in December or very shortly thereafter. So there I had the temporal structure. So that was important. And then I um, made the decision that I would introduce each of my characters first. That's a structural decision. And then have them start meeting together. So the book carried on in that structural way being very consistent all the way through. So each, each of the six characters gets his or her own say in the book. And then the group ones are all together, everyone can talk. So those were very uh, definite structural decisions on my part. I mean, at the end of a book, I have to know not only its theme, it's very important to me to work from thematic structure, um, but I also uh, have to be totally in control of all of the elements that make up the novel. 
when when the characters got together in the grief discussion group, um, the stories that you you brought with them made the discussion so incredibly rich uh, because we knew where they were coming from and who they were. Um, you Thank spoke you. about getting yeah. back at a at bad experience. You spoke about getting back at bad experiences by writing the version you wish you had lived. Has the reverse ever happened that you wrote your way to a solution to a problem you were wrestling with at the moment of writing? That I, that, would you repeat that? that yes, I, I will. I didn't read it very well. You spoke about getting back at bad experience by writing the version you wish you had lived. Yes. Has the reverse ever happened that you wrote your way to a solution to a problem you were wrestling with at the moment of writing. Oh, sure, that happens all the time. But that happens. <laughs> in, that happens in my sleep, you know. I mean, my I solve I solve uh, issues in my novels and in my life in my sleep. <laughs> they just, you know, I dream new scenarios um, or solutions will come to me. Um, I rely very heavily as a writer on the subconscious, no question, and on my intuition and setting the mind in a place that you know it's not totally focused going out for a walk solving problems yeah um have you ever taught writing at a university level absolutely i taught for seven eight nine years at ottawa u i've taught at trent i've been writer in residence in peterborough and i'll shout out to my friends in peterborough now um i've taught at banff uh, many times and uh, oh, University of New Brunswick. Oh, sure, I've, I've done a great deal of teaching over the last 45 years. And I still teach. I, I, I just can't take full-time jobs um, because of my work. So I will, I, I accept uh, short-term writing uh, jaunts for, you know, maximum probably two weeks. Do you also do some workshops? You did a, a wonderful workshop for our Wakefield Writers Festival a few years ago. Are you still doing workshops? Oh, if, if I'm invited, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, excuse me. I just, uh, um, Jamal is, um, uh, where did you say he was from? Kingston. Where, uh, Kingston? Yes. He's a Syrian refugee from Kingston. Yes. And he's just expressing his congratulations on your book. Oh, and, that's lovely. Um, and commenting on your generosity, uh, your human generosity. So just a uh, hello from, uh, from Jamal. And Jamal has his own book coming out in the fall. He has a young adult book coming out. And he's just had a memoir of his life in Syria accepted and just signed a contract. So I am thrilled to be one of Jamal's supporters. I've seen his work. That's brilliant. Um, who will he be published by, did you say? Um, I, he's told me ECW, yeah. Uh, I'm just, um, Francis, is there a breakdown moment in your book, a moment of emotional crisis? Well, for individuals, perhaps. I mean, I can pick the, I can pick the spots in some of my novels, for instance, deafening the emotional mm, moment around which the entire novel pivots is the dish throwing scene, uh, which is penultimate. It's about three chapters before the ending. Um, that everything comes to, that is the emotional peak of, of my novel for deafening. With this one, uh, because I'm dealing with, uh, with different, with multiple characters and each is as important as the other, it's important um, that uh, some of them have more emotional moments than others. Some are in better shape than others. Some are bruised and hurting badly. They are, they are helping one another and they begin to connect. Um, some still have issues at the end of the book because as a writer, I never solve all the problems in a book. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't like tying up all the ends. My, I like realism and it's, it's not realistic in life to solve everybody's issues and pretend everything's hunky-dory. That's just not the way life works. Um, but they do help one another and they come to support one another. So I guess the emotional uh, peaks in this particular novel would be around um, uh, their individual moments in the presence perhaps of the others, when the others move in and rally. 
So I guess if there's a moment for me, it would be, this is uh, the other, by the way, the subtitle, but this is a personal subtitle, is um, Six Funerals and a Wedding. So <laughs> for, for me, uh, there's, I'm, not, I'm just not gonna give it away. <laughs> Um, I think we have time for uh, one more question, Francis, before uh, we must uh, we must end. And um, I'd like to, someone is asking, how has the pandemic affected your writing routine? You're, soli you're solitary when you're writing, but might this be too much solitude? It's a bit too much for my taste, <laughs> for sure, because I really miss my family. I really miss my friends. Um, we are pretty much living in lockdown conditions here. I live in a condo. Of course, I go out every day. My husband goes out running. I go out walking. We exercise. I do my fitness classes on Zoom and, and uh, you know, on my computer. Um, but I miss the human contact because I'm such an outgoing person, despite the fact that, in fact, I live like a hermit normally and have to uh, be alone most of the time to do my work. I'm still a very sociable uh, person and I like my friends and I like to, uh, yeah, I like to interact with people. So that, that's big for me and it has affected my writing. And I did feel really edgy at the beginning of this. Um, I had hoped to, fin I'm halfway through another novel. Um, I had hoped to be further along with it at this point, um, but my editor is not putting any pressure on me. Thank you, Jennifer, and my agent is not putting any pressure on me. Thank you, Jackie. Um, because we all know conditions have changed and, and the conditions are affecting each of us in different ways, but also in common ways. And uh, I'm, I've had to relearn and I'm still relearning how to adapt to this, how to adjust. Do I wanna sit here every day and just work, work, work? No, I'd like that interspersed with uh, yeah, something else <laughs> would be nice. Well, Francis, um, I think that this evening um, we've connected with you in, in a very real, very authentic way. I think you shared some, um, some, some, some of your personal thoughts, your feelings, and um, we may not be sitting a couple of feet from each other, but the paradox of, uh, of this time is that uh, even though we're far apart, I think, um, the int intentionality of connection is, is making us feel close together. We are listening. Um, we are engaging. Uh, when someone asks, well, how are you? It's a real question. So I think that uh, you've helped us connect this evening in a very real way. And, um, and in the same way, um, I'd like to thank you. Thank you for your book. Um, it's a beautiful, and um, a timely book for the times we're living, the company we keep. Um, so many, as you've just spoken, we're experiencing loss and grief in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, uh, and your book, The Company We Keep, speaks to our need for connection. It speaks to our need for friendship. We've just spoken about that as well, for speaking out about who we are and for others to bear witness to our lives in a very real way. Um, it shows, your book shows that we're not alone. Um, it connects us, it offers solace, um, and the possibility that we can all, even during these times, recreate the story of a, our life as we want it to be right now. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, Linda Spalding says of your book, this is a book that brings comfort and joy. So very much a book for now. Um, thank you, Francis, and thank you everyone for being with us this evening. As I mentioned earlier, please check out uh, Francis's website at francisitani.com. Um, I'd also like you to, I also invite you uh, to get in touch, uh, at least for uh, Ottawa folks, uh, with Perfect Books at perfectbooks.ca uh, to either go there or to place your online order for the company we keep, as well as Mrs. as Ms., as well as Mr. Tani's other novels. And anywhere you are in the world, whether you're in the States, in Europe, across Canada, um, support your independent bookstore. Um, they all carry Mr. Tani's novels and um, it would be wonderful to, uh, to uh, have, uh, have you uh, uh, enjoy it. So I do encourage you to do that. And um, 
thanks to the Ottawa International Writers Festival, the Ottawa Public Library for, for, the, for, uh, for this evening. And um, uh, as Mr. Harvey Slack said earlier, the next online event will be the Pull of the Stars with the wonderful Emma Donahue on Monday, August 24th at uh, 7.30 p.m. So I invite you to take good care of each other, engage with each other, ask how you are, and uh, be well, everyone. Thank you very much again, Francis. Thank you. Thank everyone. you. Thank you.